Ready? Go ahead. Uh, welcome to A Lens in the Mirror, How Surveillance is Pictured in the Media and Public Culture. Uh, I'm Michael Shaw, the publisher of Bag News Notes. Uh, if you're not familiar with our site, uh, we're the only uh, spot on the web 100% dedicated to the analysis of news photos. Uh, we do investigative journalism and photo analysis in the name of best practices in news photography. Uh, we're advocates for visual literacy and media literacy in our increasingly visual culture. <laughs> And our online discussion series, the Bag News Notes, uh, Bag News Salon, I'm sorry, uh, this is our 23rd program. Uh, we looked at how uh, the major issues of the day are visualized uh, photographically in the media. Publisher of Bag News Notes. Uh, we're not familiar with our site. Hold on. Uh, Let me the only uh, spot on the web 100% dedicated to the analysis of news photos. Uh, we do I'm investigating myself. Photo analysis, the name you of the I think someone has the website app. Uh, for oh, sorry, maybe I do. And our online Ah, there we go. Okay, so uh, let me pick up where I was. Um, we're very excited about this salon and the opportunity to partner with the uh, Open Society Foundation and their documentary photography project. As part of the programming surrounding their current Watching You, Watching Me exhibition, looking at how contemporary artists address surveillance, our approach seemed to complement perfectly, looking at how the issue is framed in the media and in public culture. Today's program, by the way, is being live tweeted by contributor Philip Perdue uh, from Indiana University under the hashtag Salon Eyes. That's S A L O N E Y E S. Um, I'll be watching the thread also, and we're going to try and bring questions and comments from Twitter as we can into the discussion. Um, briefly, though, I have a number of people to thank. Uh, starting with Amy Yankins, Yukiko Yamagata, and uh, Siobhan Reardon of Open Society. They've been fabulous to work with, um, wonderfully rigorous, and uh, we're so appreciative of the collaboration. I want to thank uh, Marvin Heiferman and Meg Handler, uh, Bag News Editor-at-Large, for the very um, thoughtful uh, and thorough work on the edit we'll, we'll be relating to today. Um, and also Teresa Mahoney, our very talented producer here at um, the Salon. I also want to thank our student partners and contributors at Newhouse School, University of Illinois, and Colorado State. I'm proud to say that a third of the images in the edit today came from their recommendations. Um, and also thank you to Mike Davis, Katie Irwin, and uh, Karen Anderson for making that happen. I want to thank an esteemed group of panelists who you'll be meeting uh, more formally in a moment, Pete, Simone, Rachel, Marvin again, Hamid, and Simone, and, and, and Simon. Uh, and I usually say a few words at the outset about the creation of the edit, but um, besides mentioning the fact that Marvin and Meg went through perhaps a thousand images and our student contributors uh, supplied us with a hundred more, I'll let Marvin address um, uh, the edit uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, and uh, last but not least, let me introduce you and turn the program over to a friend, a colleague, and our esteemed moderator, one of the most respected scholars in the world of digital communications and rhetoric, uh, from the University of Illinois, uh, Kara Finnegan. Welcome. Thanks, Michael. Um, uh, as Michael said, I'm going to moderate today's discussion, and my first uh, task is to introduce our panelists for today. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, this uh, diverse and wonderful uh, group of people who will bring a variety of perspectives to the question of surveillance. Uh, Pete Brook is a writer and curator who publishes the blog Prison Photography. He also writes for Raw File, the photography blog of Wired Magazine, and his work has appeared in other outlets including Aperture and the Huffington Post. Pete has curated a number of, uh, curated a number of international exhibitions. He regularly speaks about the criminal justice system at conferences and symposia, and he runs photography workshops in prisons. Simone Brown is Assistant Professor of Sociology and African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Her work on race, identity, social media, and surveillance has appeared in a variety of outlets, including the journals Critical Studies, or sorry, Cultural Studies and Critical Sociology. And her book, Dark Matters, on the Surveillance of Blackness, will be published uh, in October 2015 by Duke University Press. Rachel Hall is Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Louisiana State University, where her work focuses on feminist surveillance and security studies, visual culture, and performance. She is the author of Wanted, 
the outlaw in American visual <laughs> culture. And uh, forthcoming from Duke University Press in October, The Transparent Traveler, The Performance and Culture of Airport Security. Marvin Heiferman, as Michael mentioned, is a co-producer of today's salon. He is a curator and writer whose work explores the impact of photographic images on art and visual culture. He is a core faculty member in the International Center of Photography Bard College MFA program in Advanced Photographic Studies. And he teaches in the School of Visual Arts MFA pro program in photography, video, and related media. During the last 15 years, he has conceived and produced exhibitions and online content for a variety of institutions, including the International Center of Photography and the Smithsonian, um, the latter of which served as the basis for his uh, very important 2012 book, Photography Changes Everything. Hamid Khan is coordinator of the Stop LA Spying Coalition, where he has sought to draw attention to the ways that domestic spying affects local communities and functions as a form of social control. As founder and executive director of the South Asian Network, Khan helped to create the first community-based organization dedicated to informing and empowering South Asians in Southern California. He has a long history of activism in social justice work in Southern California, and in 2011, he served as an Open Society Foundation Fellow uh, to accompany his work on the Stop LA Spying Coalition. Simon Menner is an artist whose project, Top Secret Images from the Stasi Archives, was featured in the Open Society Foundation surveillance exhibition that prompted today's salon. During the last decade, his projects have been featured in dozens of group and solo exhibitions, and his work appears in several public collections, including those of the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago and the Berlin State Museums. He regularly lectures about the themes of surveillance, power, uh, and fear visible in his art, and he lives and works in Berlin. So those are our panelists today. Um, uh, so let's get rolling on talking about some of these images. If we could put up our first image in the edit. Um, this image, uh, I guess a kind of photo illustration we might say, uh, appeared in The Guardian about a month ago. Um, and, and it was there uh, simply to illustrate a story about a European report on the threat of mass surveillance in Europe. And so I thought this image might serve as a good introduction to some of the themes of our conversation today. Uh, and so. Uh, Marvin Heiferman, why don't you say a little bit about uh, this photo edit we're looking at today and some of the goals and themes behind it, and then maybe that will serve as a jumping off point to talking about this and then the other images. In the sure. We, uh, Meg Handler and I spent uh, a number of months looking around online, at, uh, online and in print at news reports, at uh, opinion pieces that were published on blogs and websites and gossip sites. and. Uh, works that were shown in art galleries to try to look at the range of photographic imagery that was used either as surveillance or to represent the process of surveillance. And that's what we try to do in the edit for today is to give a, an overview of the kinds of images that are being made and suggest what kinds of um, people or sources or organizations make them. So we'll be looking at images that are produced by or for uh, photojournalists or stock photographers and stock agencies, images made by artists, images made by remote cameras or drones or CCTV cameras, images made by governmental agencies, images made by corporations and um, of that sort. So it's a, it's a broad variety of them and it's really been selected to give us the widest parameters to talk about the phenomenon of surveillance. Um, so I hope we'll see how it works. Yeah, we talked um, as we were prepping the salon about the idea that we hope that the salon today produces, um, in, in some ways, is kind of a, a, a live action research effort, a process of discovery where we can all, uh, from the variety of perspectives that you all offer um, in, in your work and in your backgrounds, look at images and um, try to get a, a sense of how uh, we're seeing surveillance today. Um, you know, it strikes me that this image in particular uh, hits on a lot of the themes that we tend to kind of maybe that tend to come first to mind when we think about surveillance. So I'd be curious to hear um, uh, to hear from panelists about uh, you know when you think about your work in surveillance or when you talk to people about your work are these the kinds of images that people tend to kind of call to mind first and then if so what is it about these images that makes them 
uh, uh, you know, kind of thematic in terms of surveillance. Is that is that actually the way surveillance looks today? That would be my question. I think that's uh, it's very easy to look at these images and uh, say, well, this is surveillance. But this is not the threatening part of surveillance. The surveillance we experience are the m m most scary surveillance uh, that surrounds us is actually the surveillance we can't grasp. It's the surveillance that collects actual normal data uh, and not the, the surveillance that's produced by um, cameras at the, uh, mounted on posts or, uh, at the street corner. It's more the, um, the collection, bulk collection of everything and the algorithm behind the, um, the um, analyzing these data. And that's, that's not shown in these images, because this is something you cannot show, actually, I would argue. What I like about this image is the way that all of them actually have to do with screens and surveillance and our kind of interface with the technology, whether it's a keyboard or looking at a smartphone or the CCTV camera, or maybe just like an eye with all of these screens, perhaps looking at a bank of uh, closed circuit fees. But one of the things with a lot of this, I noticed with a lot of the stock images of, um, of surveillance, is that who gets to use this surveillance, who's subjected to it, is often figured as white and mm -hmm. or light and at least or blue eyes, white hands on a keyboard, and gendered in a particular way. And so even with stock footage, it kind of absences um, those who are perhaps subject to maybe a lot more surveillance in city spaces, like with closed circuit uh, uh, TV or um, perhaps who doesn't code and who doesn't get to learn how to code, and even who um, you know, has um, access to these technologies through smartphones or dial-up or these types of things. So there's a lot going on with even just stock footage of these images. I think it also uh, gives life to some of, the, some of the language that gets used and terminology that uh, we use as well. For example, just looking at the keyboard, um, as it was stated earlier, but another way, just kind of, uh, this is what data mining would look like. This is how information is being gathered. This is how information is being then patterns are being created and and, and seen. And then similarly, um, you know the, the 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 heavy use of biometrics. Uh, so when you look at the other uh, images as well, the the eye, for example. I mean that says quite a bit. Just the, the looking at a person and trying to gather. Uh, the world out of that person um, and, and taking the iris scan and the retina scans and everything else and then uh, the rest of it also gives life to it that how your phones are being tapped and how anything that you're doing on a cell phone that is being gathered and then the, the, the tools for the architecture of surveillance, the CCTV, uh, the closed close circuit TV camera. Um, so that it, it really, when I look at these images, it, it goes to show it kind of gives life to the terminology that we use and the way we talk about surveillance. I would, when I look at these stock images, I would describe them as anxious images. Um, and it's interesting that, um, well, on the one hand, we say we're so comfortable, we're too comfortable with surveillance these days. If we look at the kinds of images that get reproduced in news stories about surveillance technologies, they are images like these, which I think use uh, repetition um, and contrast between light and dark to create a, a sense of anxiety or foreboding. Uh, and, and I think that's noteworthy and, and interesting. Um, so the repetition of the numbers, the repetition of the screens as communicating um, some sort of threat uh, of being outnumbered or outpaced. Um, and in the image of the young woman uh, where her face is lit by the phone, we have perhaps a kind of play um, with um, immersion and, uh, and a threat of alienation. She's turning toward her phone, you know, and a kind of social anxiety about what is she turning away from in turning toward her phone. So I think it's, I, I just think it's interesting that the, the images that get reproduced over and over again tend to communicate a level of anxiety um, the more dystopic side of tech discourses about technology as opposed to the more utopic side of those discourses. I, I think that's a really interesting point, and you mentioned earlier that you thought there was a certain kind of comfort level with these images, mm -hmm. which I think is an interesting aspect of them. They're all kind of 
kind of symmetrical. They're all, they've all got a certain kind of elegance about them. They're not terribly scary, although they touch on a certain kind of symbolism of scariness. So there's an everydayness about stock photography that kind of steers away from the real scary terror of what this might mean as, as opposed to just putting up symbolic images that can be used in one context or another, depending on who rents these images for use. Well, I think too, if we think about like when I, um, I, I teach uh, t stock photography to my students and this sort of always blows their mind because they never think, right, stock photography is supposed to be the thing we don't ever really look at or notice. Mm -hmm. and, right. and, um, when we think about stock images, yeah, I just want to kind of go back to underscore um, something Simone said earlier, which is, uh, uh, you know, how are they constructing the way that we uh, think of the ubiquity of, um, of uh, anxiety about surveillance and the way that we think about who is surveilled and and then who isn't. So, you know, do I mean, just, I guess my question for all of you would be, um, uh, do images like this that appear, you know, accompanying a mainstream media story, do these distance people from the very material aspects of surveillance that Simon was talking about earlier and that we're going to definitely be taking up today, or do you think they give people some kind of a window? into these issues that they wouldn't have otherwise. I think they do <coughs> I think they do different things. With the exception of the um, bottom right picture of the surveillance camera, which contrasted against the other three seems quite outdated. You know, we've had surveillance cameras in our news feeds since the eighties. The surveillance camera is a pretty crude and visible tool. Um, the top two look as if they've been influenced by Hollywood more than actual surveillance, which goes back to what Simon said with his first comment. You know, a computer screen glowing back at us that's in the language of the computer, it's not a language we understand. And the top two images seem to me as like illustrations because we can't grasp the scope and the ubiquity. Um, but I agree with Rachel here. I am very anxious when I look at this collection or all together. Um, and I think maybe the, the question we still need to ask ourselves always and going forward is like, how complicit are we in the surveillance and data mining of our information? You know, it's our social graph that is worth money to corporations and is worth security to the state. I just want to quickly add here that, um, that I think it's also, uh, as an organizer, uh, it just a picture a thousand words kind of thing. So I, I did, I shared this with one of our other organizers and she immediately picked up. Uh, it says, oh, without even talking about it, I think it, it, it kind of, it's a powerful tool uh, to uh, bring it to the communities and when we talk about it, just kind of using this as, as an opportunity to start that and generate that conversation. So I think everything that, echoing everything that is being said, but uh, these, these definitely become powerful tools and images uh, for organizing as well. So they can kind of become an entree into a conversation that might raise exactly. awareness yeah. among people that aren't really thinking about this, you know, kind of at the front of their mind all the time. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why don't we move on um, to the second image, and this, Simon, um, is, is from your project. Um, this image comes from uh, Simon Menner's project, Top Secret Images from the Secret Stasi Archives. Um, and Simon, I'm, I wonder if you might launch our conversation about this image with a little bit of, a, bit of background for us on this project. Um, uh, and then given that what you are doing in this project is working with historical images, I wonder if you might also talk a little bit about how you saw this work um, connecting to the contemporary themes of surveillance uh, that were in the OSF Foundation uh, exhibit overall. Um, so how you think about this project connecting to more contemporary modes of surveillance today. Mm. Um, so the, the, the project I was working on for let's say two to three years was um, I was able, I, I was granted access to the archive that was left by East Germany's notorious secret police, the Stasi. Um, and it's, it's material they collected uh, during their, um, their period of existence which spanned like close to 40 years, uh, so they were in operation for 40 years. 
And um, I was very intrigued by finding material that represents the, the gaze of Big Brother. So we are talking so much, the panel here and the outside world, we are talking so much about surveillance, but the, with the, 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 it's a weird conversation because we are talking about images and accept at the same time that we are talking about images we are not <laughs> able to see, which is kind of absurd. So we are talking about a meta level of on images, so these images remain hidden, and we we have accepted that mostly. And I came to realize with a very unique history in Germany, um, we have this amazing archive that is pretty much open to all kinds of research, and even research by a person like me, an artist. And um, so I was digging into this material for quite some time, and. This is uh, the picture shown here is from an observation on post, a post box where everyone who's, who mailed a letter, um, the picture was taken. So um, you have these huge sets of images, one after the other, of people just dropping in um, letters one after the other. So, the, but this is, this is pretty much what we expect surveillance to look like. Um, and if I if I'm then asked about the contemporary value of these images, so if I could choose um, and uh, to work with a certain set of images, I would choose the last two weeks of NSA surveillance. That would be definitely the most interesting material to work with. But that's not possible. As of course, that is not possible. So th then, how far in history? until we find something that we can actually really access without restriction. And that's as close as we get to us here and now, is we have to go back a quarter of a century now and to look at material that was taken in the 70s and 80s if we wanted to look at the real Big Brother without restriction. And so we have to keep in mind that even though many of these images I, I found at the archive look strange and absurd and funny very often, that Stasi was on an eye-to-eye -eye level with all the other secret services. They were far more professional than West German um, secret agencies um, at the time. So they, if, the Stasi, if the GDR wouldn't have ceased to exist, um, the Stasi would be tapping our phone lines, and the Stasi would try to get access to our cell phones, and it would try to get access to our our Facebook accounts and so on. So um, yeah, that's the that's uh, that that's the contemporary aspect of that. We have to keep in mind that the NSA material from the same era looked exactly the same. I would argue, I would guess. Yeah, that point about invisibility, I think, is really interesting. That to be able to see what's being collected, right? Um, yeah. Have to go back. Uh, yeah, and the thing is, the thing is, um, I so with a with a unique <coughs> German history, we had two the two opposing sides of the Cold War within one society, and they were struggling within Germany. And I tried for over a year to get my hands on material from the West German archives. Of course, they did the same similar things, and um, I spoke to some agents there and. One guy was quite frank and told me, of course the same stuff exists in our archive, but you will never be able to look at it because we decide to destroy it first. <laughs> and that's, that's the same thing. So there's, and that's, that's terrible in a way because if we look just, I think it's, it, it saddens me that we're only able to look at this material because it, that seems to prove our point that um, East Germany and the communists, they were terrible. They did terrible things. Because we can find easily, and we easily find the proof that they did these terrible things, because this archive is open. The other archive remains closed, so there's no way for us to find the same points and to find the same terrible things they did. They, of course, in the West, they did break the law, and the Stasi, they knew they, they broke the law. They knew that, and um, they broke the law to um, defend the law which sounds very uh, contemporary, I would argue, <laughs> because that's <laughs> almost every uh, secret service does and every police office tends to do. So that's a weird argument here. 
And so we could we could debate it far better if these Western archives were opened in a similar fashion, but they are not. I think the whole issue of archives is a really interesting one to talk about and think about. It's when I was preparing for this event, I was looking at Sandra Phillips' book that uh, documented an exhibition that SF MoMA did in 2010 called Exposed, and it's the history of voyeurism and surveillance images. So the first thing you realize is, just as this is a historical image, the history of surveillance goes back to the invention of photography, which is a wonderful kind of idea to look at and study, and frightening as well. But the other issue is that you raised that I think is great is what happens to these images, how they get archived, whether they're accessible or not, how long these archives are maintained. One of the big issues in terms of current imaging for things like red light cameras or um, you know uh, police wearing cameras, uh, body cameras, is what happens to images as they get made, how long do agencies hold on to them, uh, what happens to them, when do they get deleted, who, who gets access to them. Mm. Yeah, we, during my research I found very strange images where you see agents from Western spy agencies that were able to move within Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Germany, um, and they encounter the Stasi agents in both sides taking yes. pictures. So they have one spy taking a picture of the other spy while he takes a picture back, which is very funny. Yeah. And so with this material in hand, I approached the British archive and told them, well, actually it would be amazing to have this material from your side as well, because then you could combine the two shots. And it's very telling to me that even though these shots are very innocent in a way because they don't show anything, they don't reveal anything. I was not able to get my hands on them. So I know they still exist, but someone is who is in charge um, can decide which image to use and which we we won't get access to. And that's that's not democratic, I would argue. We've got a question from Twitter um, that I want to roll into the conversation on this point, but I just wanted to uh, ask really quickly, we're getting a little bit of feedback still, and so I want to remind the panelists, if you have the Bag News Notes site open, which is broadcasting the salon live, you want to close that, but still stay in the Google Hangout. A little bit of a tech moment here, so. And if you have questions about that, um, uh, Therese can help you on the chat. Um, so the question from Twitter, um, which I, I, is emerging out of this conversation, Simon, about your uh, image and your project is, um, where do you think the line is uh, between found footage or found photos and surveillance? Ah, it's, it's tricky. It's very, the image shown here is relatively harmless. There have been um, terrible images I found um, at the archive where the Stasi broke into apartments and documented everything. So, and I was, it was, I had many discussions with the with the staff at the archive whether to show these images or not because in a way it's reproducing the terrible things the Stasi has done. But I think if we really want to talk about this terrible truth of surveillance, sometimes we do have to show it uncensored and unfiltered. And then, yes, we do repeat it. And yes, working with archives sometimes does repeat the surveillance process. But um, if we then all show it only filtered and censored, it looks far too harmless, I guess. So, yeah, we have to show it, I, I, I fear. Yeah. I just want to note that Twitter question was from Tani P. Yeah, Rachel? Um, one thing that I find just really interesting and uh, provocative and valuable about Simon's project um, is, is this notion that we can use these historic images to think about what's going on right now. And I'm struck as I look at this image, um, you know, the images we tend to see today of um, 
surveillance of public spaces are produced by CCTV camps. Um, and I tend to associate that kind of imagery, it's boring, um, it's, it, it feels dead, it feels like nothing's happening even as we understand that that type of imagery is you know waiting, it's, it's there, it's capturing because it's waiting for an event, it's waiting for something to happen. Um, but this image, by contrast, this photographic image, um, strikes me as very rich um, in detail, uh, much more visually interesting. Perhaps that is, you know, due to my interest in photography as a medium. Um, but also that it um, that there's there's a real sense of, uh, for me at least, uh, suspense and foreboding in this image um, where. You know, something very mundane is happening on the surface of things, but there's something about the um, the perspective, uh, the medium length of the shot, the the sense that someone's on a stakeout making this photograph that causes the suspicion of the person making the photograph to not remain there, but for me at least as a spectator to get kind of transferred to these women and the baby carriage such that I almost feel like, you know, something, something's about to happen here, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's for me also reminiscent of um, Blow Up, you know, Antonioni's film Blow Up. So you get the sense that if you could just um, look closely enough at all of the details captured within this image, something sinister would reveal itself. I had sort of that feeling too, and I probably watch entirely too many spy thrillers or the American. But I wonder, <laughs> are they making a drop? You know, are they going to put chalk on the board yeah. or something yeah. like that? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, well, the thing is, I would argue that many of the spies at the Stasi were also reading too many spy novels. <laughs> and that's a terrible. And that's yeah. no. That, in a way, it's funny, but it's also a terrible part of the truth because mm -hmm. they were also expecting something to mm -hmm. be in these images and something to be hidden in these images. And then we come to the limitations of photography mm -hmm. when we realize, yes, of course, you can look at this image uh, in an Antonioni way, mm -hmm. that it hides something and you have to uncover it. But most of the things they seem to have documented there was nothing they really documented. And that's that's the problem if you have such an authoritarian system like a surveillance apparatus that cannot be controlled from the outside. That you have people in charge who look at images and look at documents or proof and find something hidden there. And that's that's very dangerous. And you see it so often at the Stasi archive that they documented something and you look at this and you figure out, okay, someone was sent to jail for this document, but it does not show anything besides the thing the person inter interpreting the picture wanted it to show. Simon, you just proved your point there about how this work can teach us about surveillance today. Um, I didn't understand what the picture was until you explained it to me. So the Stasi's solution to like finding out what was going on was to blanketly photograph everyone who posted a letter, mm -hmm. and they found a lot of their information was just useless. Um, but this photo wouldn't happen today because now people would just monitor text messages and SMS, but they would also find the same thing. A lot of the information was useless. Yeah. But in terms of like the states. Um, Problem solving is to just look at everything and hope they catch something in the net. You know, that logic hasn't shifted much. Yeah, but the problem is, um, the problem we encounter goes far beyond catching everything and finding something in there. Because um, the basic, basic problem of surveillance is, um, the, the English term for this is great, you cannot prove a negative. So there's no way for you to ever find a proof in these images that nothing happened. And you cannot, if you collect everything, you will never find a proof that nothing happened. And no one I intended something evil. So that makes you create algorithms that interpret uh, interpret things in a way that in fact in the end you find someone who did something bad. 
maybe this wouldn't have resulted in a bad action, but you find someone who's off the grid, who acts in an unnatural way or uh, in a way he or she shouldn't have acted. And that's, a, that's yeah, so it is bad. Yeah, I mean, these, a lot of these images are boring, and a lot of them are about the information you extract from them. You know, we're looking at this picture of somebody posting a letter, and it's reminding me of photographs made around the time of the Boston bombing, where the police went back and looked for every frame that had a stray package in it. So it's, uh, it's, you take these banal images and then go back in them and either manually or algorithmically search for what you're looking for. So it's uh, interesting. This is kind of an interesting harbinger of those kind of images. If we, um, if we move on from Simon's image to the next image in the edit, um, we need to go one back. Uh, there we go. Um, this image, which is extremely dense and, and there's a lot we can say about it, um, uh, this image, part of what it's doing is maybe suggesting a shift from, you know, with Simon's image there was some kind of an agent there right, collecting these photographs. Um, and here uh, we now have the machines doing it for us to, uh, to a large extent. So this image, uh, which takes a while visually to apprehend, at least it does for me, um, is a, an image of a display in a ground control station uh, of the view from the camera of an unmanned aerial uh, military vehicle called the Reaper. So you can see the caption there describing this. So essentially, uh, this is an image um, that is being collected, analyzed, without necessarily uh, a whole lot of human intervention. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this image. I'm particularly interested in hearing how people think about its just kind of density of information and, and what does that communicate to us about surveillance. Hmm. Sorry if I... Oh, no, someone else should start now. It's, it's, when I first saw this edit, I said to Michael, I need some help here, right? Like, <laughs> this, and, 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 and okay. I think that's partly the point of an image like this, is to try to figure out for whom, for whom is this image yeah. sensible and readable? And these, that seems to me to be very much a part of uh, these images. what's happening now with technology. When I, but the thing is, the thing is with these images, so it, these drone images or images from Apache helicopters. Whenever I see them now, I, I get extremely angry because um, we have all we have to keep in mind that for these images are released and leaked by the U.S. government to the public, like successful drone drone operations, successful drone strikes. But we all have to keep in mind that um, Chelsea Manning is currently in jail for, among other things, releasing one of those videos the U.S. government didn't want us to see, mm -hmm. and he's going to, uh, she's going to spend 35 years in prison for really leaking something like that. So we have to be extremely careful if we look at these images and. They, we should never believe that these images show the real truth of the drone operation because this is so so filtered in so many levels. On so many levels, these are just the the poster shots of drone operations <coughs> that we are going to see because the the real truth of drone operations and drone strikes we will never see because this is this remains highly classified. When I, I saw this image. Go ahead, please. Um, when I saw this image, I was reminded of Marita Sturkin's argument about the, uh, the iconic images that emerged from the first Gulf War. And she talks about bombs in the night sky over Baghdad. And she talks about the point of view shot of a smart bomb approaching its target. And these were the images that got reproduced over and over again in the media during that war. And she argues that they were reproduced and circulated because they communicate a kind of myth of um, high-tech warfare as clean warfare, mm -hmm. low-casualty warfare. And so I saw this image, and of course, 
drone warfare is is being trumpeted, you know, in that in that same sort of way, um, as as high tech, as cleaner somehow, as lower risk at least for the U.S. Um, but then what's interesting is that as as Kara said in her introduction to the image, this image is so visually messy. There's nothing clean at all about the image. It doesn't look clean at all, right? Um, and so I find that. Uh, to, to, to be very interesting and that this overlay of all of this um, technically specific information communicates to us as laypersons everything that we don't understand about what we're looking at. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, uh, um, I think it also depending as to who's looking at this image as well, uh, having been to, I mean I'm originally from Pakistan and uh, having spoken to people there and being to places where on the receiving end of uh, uh, the, the drone warfare, I think people look at this image a little bit differently as well because this becomes a clearly a lived experience and an everyday experience for folks. Um, and also helps in debunking and, and this whole notion of clean warfare we have you know, over a thousand children who've been killed and you know, a few thousand just innocent people. So, so I mean, this whole war about targeted killing. But, but I think I, I just want to maybe just take a second here and link it uh, to the previous slide as well. Uh, that there, there's a, there's a, there's clearly a contrast between this image, which which goes to show uh, just on the screen that there is some target that is uh, with all the, uh, the 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 coordinates and um, you know everything else the way it's been sectioned off. Um, and something on the ground, and then uh, the the photo of uh, the stroller and two women by the post box. Uh, I think it, it it also helps us in taking a step back as to what is what is a narrative that is that has been created, and what is a long term impact. Um, of course, you know there's uh, the the whole um, idea being that they're looking for a needle in a haystack, and it's being justified by this this enormous amount of information gathering and storing and sharing. But if we take it a step further, um, how these, now this image about the drone that war abroad, how it just comes home and how this military technology gets used on a local level. And previously about this whole uh, extension of uh, the, the, the post box, that now um, the, the information that, that in a way there's always the underlying narrative being that there's always the other, some, some enemy, something that we are trying to protect ourselves from. Um, but then how it becomes codified into our daily living. And, and, and I want to just use a couple examples that when we talk about information sharing and surveillance, um, I think it still, it still leaves a certain level of sensationalism in, the, in our conversation, that it kind of creates this very sensationalist kind of sense of surveillance and spying. But how surveillance and information gathering is being shared even in the context of uh, public benefits, for example, that how information that has been gathered uh, through various mechanisms impact people's Section 8 vouchers on um, public housing or food stamps or, you know, so how you, so our bodies are being policed as a result of this information gathering. Um, secondly, we are also seeing that the, the narrative in the United States is around counterterrorism and national security, but how those, um, how counterterrorism and national security is being codified into domestic policing and global policing. And the more we are finding out, um, some of the some of the work in LA and the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition that I'm with, that we, we just recently, uh, the Inspector General did an audit of LAPD's um, counterterrorism program called the Suspicious Activity Reporting. And this is a second audit that came out, and which highlights uh, that how it gets codified into domestic policing and how a culture of suspicion and fear is being created, that, that 30% in a city that has less than 10% African American population, 30% of these secret files going to these fusion centers were open on African Americans. Um, and in the gender account, 50% were African American women. So, and, and then, so this was the second audit, and the previous audit showed that over 80% of these files were individuals identified as non white, and the largest number in that sample were blacks. So, so when we look at the whole picture, I think it's also necessary that when we are looking at these images, that in, in, that what is the long-term impact and how 
every aspect of our life is being traced and tracked and, and monitored and shared for a much larger sinister purpose of as, as programs for, and policies of social control. Right. I mean, that's one of the reasons we selected this image. I look at this and, well, you know, it's clear that or it's what's described in the caption is the source of this. You can look at it and think about how it, first of all, de dehumanizes the process of surveillance and puts out this, the um, idea of photographic images being data. But not images. We're talking so much about images. But the point is that images are full of data or are mined for data. And so, uh, you know, more contemporary version of this image is what happens when uh, license plate scanners are being used by police sitting on the side of the road. They're creating images just like this, and 70% of police cars in the United States, for example, are equipped with them where they can tell very quickly if they can extract from an image your arrest record, where your car has been, where it's going. And so this notion of the data in images and to be extracted from images is um, something that's a kind of fascinating sub-theme in the uh, kind of edit that we did for today. I'm just glad you chose this image because um, I don't think anything has served state powers better than the confusion, the strategic confusion between surveillance and drone imagery and video game imagery. You know, Hamid just described uh, very seriously what the effects of these technologies are and I don't think it helps us really to confuse the visuals whether they do or do not look like them um, with video gaming at all. I actually like this image because I don't play video games but I think any designer would lose their job if they proposed <laughs> a, a user interface like this for a 13 year old kid playing a video game. Um, but yeah, if we can let's stay away from discussion of video games. <laughs> I, I like how these this image, the one before, and actually the it kind of um, alludes to the one that's coming next uh, as well. Mm -hmm. But it reminds me there was an article a few years ago, and I teach it in my class, um, uh, called Dreams in Infrared. I think it was in Spiegel magazine, and it had to do with a drone pilot who had gone through, uh, you know, it actually at this same Cheech Air Force Base um, and uh, piloting uh, these same like HK uh, drones to then um, uh, kill, target killing, uh, you know, 10, 6,000 uh, miles away. And he talked about the idea that he, um, after leaving um, the military, still had his dreams would be um, in this color, in this kind of infrared color. And the ways in which they kind of, at one point he tells the story, um, well, tells the, the, the killing of, 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 a, of a young boy. And he said, like, did we just kill a kid? And someone said, someone, uh, you know, further away in another um, discreet place, perhaps in one of these kind of containers or trailers, said actually it was a dog. And then he said a dog with two legs. And this, the same dehumanization process um, that that, uh, that for and, and I guess in, in this case um, authorized the killing. Uh, he was able to you know narrate that how it looked visually, and I thought this kind of um, linked to that in some way. Yeah. Why don't we move on to the next image? Because I think um, uh, this image does a couple of things in terms of kind of serving as a bridge to a conversation about, um, uh, about the use of drones and about uh, the, the way that artists, um, and uh, particularly in this case, um, Tomas von Hutri is, is trying to get people to see and understand and make connections in ways that probably the previous kind of image wouldn't necessarily make, uh, at least for many of us. Um, and uh, this image uh, is part of a project uh, by Thomas Van Hootry, uh, Thomas Van Hootry, called Blue Sky Days, where he attached a camera to a drone and photographed uh, the, the kind of everyday events in the United States that have been subject to foreign airstrikes, uh, events such as weddings and other gatherings. Uh, and the full portfolio of this project was published, uh, I believe, for the first time in Harper's Magazine in April of last year, 2014. Um, Pete, you did uh, a piece on this project for Wired, um, and I wondered if we might start with you on this image. Um, what do you think makes this, this work and this project so compelling, um, and how is it doing maybe something different than we've seen with some of the earlier images we've talked about today? I think one of its strengths is its simplicity. It sets up this notion that um, 
he's going to go out and photograph very common, very joyous, normally, um, public events, family events specifically, um, in the US. And with that rubric, he, he, Thomas is spoilt for choice, really. So here we've got a wedding in Philadelphia, but he photographed sports games and community events in parks. Um, also, in that vein of simplicity, the, the title, Blue Sky Days, comes from the fact that it's easier for drones to operate when there aren't any clouds in the skies because they can see the targets better. And it's, a, it's three words that come directly from a quote of um, a Pakistani boy, a, a young teenager, who said like he didn't like Blue Sky Days, which you know, shows how um, our thinking is flipped depending on um, what powers we're subject to and what violence we're brutalized by. Um, so I think the photographs are very direct. I think they do what they say they intend to do. Um, they're also like symmetrical and very nice to look at. You know, I always say, who doesn't like an aerial view? You know, who doesn't like a, a shot from their airplane? Who doesn't like a satellite view that's captured? Um, but beyond that, I'm still I've, I've lived with these images for a while, and I'd like to ask the panel if they think they work, because I think Thomas is going directly for an emotional connection, and we talk about photography as often being an emotional medium, and I think surveillance and, and surveillance imagery challenges that. So he's tried to find this middle ground and appeal to people's humanity by photographing American weddings, American funerals, American community events. So um, that's where I still find a lot of space for debate. Has Thomas been successful and, and what, what's that definition of success? No one. A thoughtful <laughs> question. A thoughtful <laughs> question. Well, I mean, I'll go for it. I mean, it's you know, we talked about the dehumanizing kind of aspect of surveillance images, and this humanizes this. You can look at this photograph and think of, you know, a target strike, right? It has the kind of mapping elements that some of the other pictures that we looked at has, but you can also think of it in terms of, you know, Kim Kardashian's wedding and what people do to keep helicopters and drones away from photographing them. It's kind of like a Life magazine illustrative images, something that really does go for the emotion and try to humanize something, which is part of what's interesting about them. And also there's such an aesthetic uh, uh, mind, be aestheticizing mind behind these images that makes them uh, both interesting to look at and, and perhaps maybe that makes them work and maybe it doesn't make them work. I'm not sure. Yeah. There's one particular image from this series where there's like, uh, very, very long shadows that are cast. Uh, it's the picture from the baseball field. And it, it reminds me of that Rennie Burry photograph of the um, cops or businessmen on top of the skyscraper in New York. Mm -hmm. Black and white, stark right. people against a stark um, high contrast uh, floor with these long shadows cast. Um, so th there's no doubt about the aesthetic eye that Thomas brings mm -hmm. to the project. I would definitely want to uh, emphasize the role of the captions here in this project as well. So that the captions, uh, you know, and when I first showed uh, some of these images last fall to um, some undergraduate students in my class, uh, there was a lot of like coolness factor. They're very visually interesting. Uh, as Pete said, they have a, sim a simple yet uh, 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 kind of disorienting aesthetic. Um, but then married with the caption, so the caption you see here in this case, um, a wedding in central Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In December 2013, a U.S. drone reportedly struck a wedding in Rada in central Yemen, killing 12 people and injuring 14. So there's meant to be a kind of juxtaposition here that I think m bridges that gap you know, that Hamid was talking about earlier, right? Like who is looking, like who sees images in partic from particular kinds of perspectives. Um, but also, I think it's meant to lay some of that anxiety that Rachel was talking about a few images ago back onto an image that could be, wow, I wonder if I could hire a drone to photograph my wedding, right? I mean, you sort of get the sense this uh, more popular entertainment 
but um, there's both things happening simultaneously, which is, I think, that maybe at the crux of Pete's question. Um, uh, how do we read a project like this that's trying to do these, these things in a particular kind of context? I mean, this is, uh, this is really interesting. Um, just when I first saw this image and uh, read the caption, this kind of just brought this whole, uh, the whole American exceptionalism uh, to light and how, you know, how we, we live our lives. And it was in that at the same time, uh, a couple of days ago, uh, I was looking at some new Pakistan, and we were, we were discussing earlier about the drone strike and who's on the receiving end, that there were these photos of uh, so people with extremely, extremely rich because Pakistan, you know, very, very, very few people are very rich, and many, many people are, people are very poor. But there was these photos of these lavish grand weddings in Pakistan, where this whole like almost an acre of land is tented and these fancy lights, and they were actually showing a drone, a couple of drones by these photographers who were, fil and, and, and who were filming the wedding for the family, and they were using drones to film the wedding. And it was, you know, just the, uh, just the, just the contrast and the contradiction was was so much in our face. And I think this is it, it, that reminded me of just kind of linking this photo with that. That um, you know, how, what does exceptionalism mean, and and who controls it, and who takes ownership to that? Yeah, and I think also the challenge of. Um, it seems like part of the strategy here is to, as, as Kara said, to use the caption to establish um, a, a juxtaposition that opens up the possibility of critical thought and, and more specifically opens up the possibility of uh, identifying with these, uh, being in the position of being someone on the, on the ground that's, that's um, being targeted by a drone. Um, and I, it brings to mind, uh, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with, a, a, an artist collective project in Pakistan, um, Not a Bug Splat, where um, this collective is uh, making these really incredible large format portraits of children who have actually been the victims of drone attacks in Pakistan and laying these out on the ground. Um, in, in, in sites that are significant um, given the violence that has occurred in order to have these portraits of children's faces show up on the screens of drone operators and also to have these images show, show up on satellites that are used to create um, you know, uh, mapping, mapping sites and technologies. So, so there's an effort to try and archive um, to, to, to create um, uh, a, a productive identification or disidentification, but also to create a kind of archive that's going to show up in GPS systems. That's really interesting. So gathering the kind of data that, you know, sort of jamming the data gathering process, I guess, would be one way to, to, to think about a project like that. That's really compelling. In the piece that I wrote for Wired, um, I mentioned not a bug, not a bug splat, and a couple of other interventions where the artists, you know, almost hack as best they can from outside this um, pretty well solidified system. Um, and the other thing I could do only as a responsible writer was to give some figures, um, which I've since forgotten until I looked at the article here. Um, but you know, Bush was the first person to um, use drones, um, and then Obama has taken up the use of drones to the umpteenth degree that the Bush administration ever did. I think the first the first bomb used from a drone was in 2002, um, but the drone program wasn't officially acknowledged until I think as late as 2011, 2012. Everyone knew it was happening. Um, and it was around the same time that it went from being in the control of the CIA to the control of the Pentagon. So I think that's significant. It was part of the American surveillance um, <coughs> infrastructure for the, the longest time before it was like officially acknowledged and handed over to like a defense and became a defense program in the Pentagon. Um, but Obama's administration doesn't release very many 
stats, but as far as we can figure out, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism estimates that between 2,200 and 3,800 people have been killed, and as many of as many as a thousand of those could be civilians. Um, I, I mean, it's very difficult to image those numbers, uh, almost as difficult as it is to image the amount of data being mined uh, by our government. Yeah, but the, the big, big problem with the, with the drone war is that um, at the moment we are American, the American government already started killing people they don't know who they are. So with that, that, that goes together with the data mining. So algorithms decide um, who to kill. And they decide not... Very often it, he or she acts as like other terrorists would do, or a terrorist. And this, this is very scary. So you you don't you don't well you don't have to be a terrorist. You just have to act like one by switching your phone regularly or going to this town to that town, and then you are you end up on a kill list without the person who is going to kill you knows who you are. So that's yeah, it's amazing. Um, going back to representation. Uh, What's interesting to me is how easily we can talk about this image uh, given the scale. And uh, uh, it was actually uh, a wonderful experience seeing the exhibition live and being able to see the photograph uh, up close. I think we have a, a version of it where here you actually can see it much more closely. And I imagine the <coughs> from the drone you can also see uh, things much more closely. I think that. Uh, Rachel mentioned the whole, or maybe Simone was talking about, you know, what you can see and how much you can see and how that brings in a dimension of con uh, conscience uh, yeah. it, when you're actually, uh, the, the, a pilot is uh, viewing these Im images. Um, this does better, uh, when you see the photo up close, to me it, I, it almost evokes um, the, the painting, the screen, but uh, Maybe the fact that we can talk about it so easily in that much smaller scale speaks to how much also there's a kind of a, I don't know if it, a, a, we start to relate very much to the technology maybe too, too much and then we don't um, even think that we can have this more empathetic connection uh, at a closer scale. I think there's an important difference between um, the, the, I think this is a fundamentally new type of aerial photography. Um, if, if, if the aerial photography that we've been familiar with prior to d drone imagery, um, if it's fair to describe it as transcendent, as sublime, um, this hovering at a relatively low altitude directly overhead um, has a different kind of perspective that it's almost like, um, like a gravitational perspective where we can feel the, feel the pull from the drone down into um, making some kind of an intervention and perhaps a, a violent interruption of what's unfolding for the people on the ground. Um, I don't know if you all would agree that this is fundamentally a new kind of aerial photography or not. I appreciate the way Michael drew out the glance from the bride, which we clearly couldn't see from um, the smaller image on our screen, and to that degree, I would think maybe it is a type, a new type of aerial photography, in that it is allowing um, skilled practitioners like Thomas to, you know, al <laughs> almost make this very impersonal type of image making, um, uh, one that we can connect with. Like here is is made the decisive moment. I, I think another thing that's interesting about drone photography and We'll probably talk more about it later, is how it's been domesticated. I mean, there's a store in New York called, uh, there's a big camera store in New York, and they sell 400 drones a week to people. And so with the, with the kind of popularity of GoPro cameras and people wanting people's greater involvement with photographic imaging, drones provide yet another 
opportunity to create dramatic imaging and, and they become domesticated in that source too. So people are making their own drone images. People are hiring um, photographers to make surveillance pictures of people proposing to each other uh, okay. for marriage. So this the domestication of this kind of imagery is interesting to think about and talk about. And I think also uh, I'd say that when we – that. In, in a sense, this this is a new type of aerial photography, particularly when we link it with that um, that how this, this photograph potentially could be linked with several other images that are being picked up by various other tools for surveillance at the same time. So this this wedding party could be leaving this spot, and then as it was stated, the automatic license plate reader can pick up. Uh, you know the the mobility of this party as well. They are then walking down the street, and the trap wire technology that picks up body images on the street links it up. And then when they get on the cell phone, the stingray technology picks up their conversation. Uh, so I think it's it's again, and and the and the term uh, algorithm gets used, and absolutely. So then, how this process really works? So in that context, that the whole massive architectural surveillance that exists. And then when this information is put into these databases, then how it links up with, uh, you know, you could be just taking, like this this, this whole uh, taking photograph in public is now considered suspicious activity mm -hmm. under the Suspicious Active Reporting Initiative. So this, mm -hmm. so to begin with, there is a level of suspiciousness attached to it. So in essence, um, you know, so, so you, your being is, is guilty until proven innocent. So I think in, in, in that way, yeah, this, I would say that uh, what it feeds into is, is definitely uh, sort of a newer phenomenon. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting too, I mean, Pete um, mentioned earlier the, you know, the uh, and Rachel's point too about, you know, is this a new form of aerial photography? Uh, Rachel, I think you asked. and. Um, it, it really strikes me that uh, projects like Simon's, uh, projects like this one, and then projects like the next image um, uh, uh, from the work of Trevor Paglin are trying to, trying to come up with ways to use photographic art to visualize things that we can't typically see and to get at some of these dynamics. So in some ways I see uh, uh, particularly uh, Van Hootrieff and, and Paglin and then the image that we'll talk about after this uh, of the facial recognition technology as a kind of um, series of uh, experiments designed to try to figure out how, to, how, to, how do we visualize these things to get at them so that then we can be able to talk about them. Um, so maybe with that we could move on uh, to talk a bit about uh, the Paglin image. Um, uh, just a quick bit of background here, and you, again, you've got the caption in front of you. Um, Trevor Paglin's series uh, of images of the NSA and other intelligence agencies uh, kicked off uh, the site, The Intercept, just, a, uh, just about a year ago, which is the Glenn Greenwald site that began as a platform for the Edward Snowden documents, but has since uh, expanded into a, a wider mission. Um, and these images uh, by Paglin, including the one here, uh, constitute images of spaces that we rarely, if ever, see, although obviously they have tremendous import. So let's talk about this image, um, you know, maybe in light of some of the things that Pete was saying uh, earlier about um, what the U.S. government does and doesn't acknowledge uh, in terms of uh, its activities. Um, how are these images trying to invite us to see things we don't normally see or know about? Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, was it you that did an initial analysis of these three images of Paglins and you talked about how the light trailed out of the center as if it was like going into the world to feed upon the data of the world. I don't think that I did, uh, or maybe it was a guest post, but uh, it's funny that you said that because I'm just looking at this and I just keep, think, I keep thinking of illusions. I'm, I'm thinking synapses uh, and I'm seeing a brain, mm -hmm. which is, you know, maybe not an illusion actually. I will say I thought Paglin's um, 
position was very playful. You know, he went to Wikipedia and he, and went online and he found that publicly available images mm -hmm. of the three major surveillance agencies were outdated and they might have even been government provided, maybe photographs from the 90s. So he got a helicopter or a, a plane and he flew over them and he made images and he gave them away for free for anyone who wanted them. Um, a very small but like press friendly intervention, I thought. But the seductiveness is what makes them so powerful. I think there's a reason why you went at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I mean, I think this is when I when I first saw this and and linking it with some other the uh, some of the other images, uh, not just in this uh, slideshow, but that it, the it, it, there's just a scale and and size of the surveillance. Um, apparatus, but I think it's also something that, um, that there's a there's that there's a selective way of releasing images as well uh, in a very propaganda style and in in basically like psychological warfare, if you will. That it has a certain shock and awe value as well, and and in, in essence, uh, with that shock and awe value, the underlying uh, you know, messaging is also around having a chilling effect on people's activity as well, where people start altering their behaviors. So I think so, some of these images kind of, they are very evocative in a way, but they give you that shock and awe value and then have its own chilling effect on, on people. It's so interesting to me that um, we live in such a image driven world and uh, these all these conflicts they all deal with images but and so the, the, but it's always about invisibility but visible invisibility so the propaganda aspect always kicks in so you, you have to show that you don't show what you have and uh, all sides do that. The terrorists do that, and the um, NSA does it. So we we are always. This is such a such a strange time to we encounter so many weird images, and but they they, they represent so much more behind the scenes. But they also represent them really. So they have to. They they they're supposed to represent them, and with these leaks from time to time. I would argue that these um, services like NSA or CIA, they are very happy with the leaks because these leaks just scratch the surface and we all seem to be in awe about this underlying truth underneath the surface. That the huge scratch also only covers the surface of so what else might there be. So it's always about this invisibility but making it visible and so they must have amazing PR departments, even though we never get to know them, mm -hmm. because they they're so professional. And ISIS um, in Iraq, they're brilliant with their PR. And the NSA, in a way, they never put out a statement officially, but they're so brilliant. In what my full respect to their work, in a way, mm -hmm. it's terrible what they are doing, but it's so. It's so so convincing in a way. And their social media, yeah. Yeah. So is there a way to think of, I'm, I'm really struck by one of the themes that's repeating over and over again, and Simon, you just articulated it really well, which is um, this visibility, invisibility. And, and, and so it seems like in so many of these images, and this one I think maybe most strongly for me, uh, it is that sense that we're just scratching at the surface, and it does produce uh, a bit of that anxiety that Hamid talked about, that you know what really is uh, going on inside that we don't know about and that we can't see. Um, is, there, is there any way, just kind of to play devil's advocate for a moment, to read this image from the perspective of someone who, could, who might say, this is great. The US government is working day and night. Look at all those lights on in the building. You know, um, this is the hub of activity that's going to protect people around the world. I mean, one of the things I find really interesting about Peglin's project is, um, is even though it was, I think, very much as Pete talked about, produced to essentially say, 
hey, look what's right here. They don't really want us to know they're here, but they're right here, and I can fly over in a helicopter. But at the same time, right, it gets back to Simon's point. Um, um, maybe this is fine for them. Maybe they're okay. You know, is there a way to read these, this image in more than one way in terms of the question of the value of surveillance, maybe? I think it's, an, it's always an open question, which is why surveillance becomes so pervasive. You know, with the spread of uh, CCTV cameras in cities and towns across the United States, where large chunks of municipal budgets are going towards buying cameras, there's always the argument, does surveillance photography, does do surveillance cameras protect us? And it's very hard to quantify, and I think people raise the question, and it never quite gets answered. It's, it's one of the other interesting issues about wearable cameras and surveillance and photography and the adaptation of body cameras by police, which we'll talk about probably a little bit later too, um, as to whether surveillance, whether the idea that images are taken is itself a, you know, a productive, um, you know, is, is a good thing in terms of protecting us. Yeah, I think when you're already operating within the discourses of prevention, um, well, if the event or events that we are trying to prevent don't take place, then how can you argue that those who are acting on our behalf to prevent the events that never took place aren't the ones responsible for the fact that they didn't take place? And it becomes, you know, utterly absurd, but also a way that um, these organizations can justify uh, ever-expanding budgets and that's something that these images this this Peglin image communicates to me with its um, sort of sprawling horizontal horizontal architecture and the ways that the roads come out from the buildings there's there's a there's a way in which that I think makes concrete um, you know these institutions that remain very for the most part very abstract for us but also it points to the immense and I would argue obscene amounts of resources right that that go to this work of prevention where the ends always seem to justify the means and I think it's also uh, something just just thank you for, for uh, lifting it like that and just echoing that and building on it that is, is where um, how the challenges it creates in at least our work in our organizing and outreach and raising community awareness as to where where the events have not happened, but that goes to show uh, the 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 kind of pre prevention that is taking place as well that we would never know. But but this also kind of creates this this whole element of uh, you know what do I have to worry about? You know what do I have to hide? So I have nothing to hide, anyways. Um, and then there's another layer to it too, that particularly people who've, uh, and I think one of the, and that goes to show that how our responses have been sort of couched in this very narrow realm of privacy as well, because, uh, and that becomes, I mean, we would say that becomes very much a white privilege, mm -hmm. that because that how the narrative has been controlled by white privilege as well, that where communities who have never had privacy historically speaking, where their lives have just been bared. So I think that takes on a different significance. But in, you know, just how then this technology gets further advocated for, uh, where how do we, how communities prevent themselves, protect themselves from those undesirables coming in. Um, but when it's, there's, there's a different conversation when we are speaking to day laborers versus going to Santa Monica, folks who are living on the west side, or, you know, when you're speaking to the transgendered uh, uh, community versus, you know, so there, there's, there, so how it gets layered, uh, it kind of opens up that this imagery helps us in then broadening the scope of the conversation and then just, to, you know, just how do we, we shift these narratives as well. I think also, which is on an aside to that, what's noticeably absent, at least in in uh, Piglin's project, is the CIA refused to have um, or denied his request to have the um, aerial photography taken of their of their um, compound. And so, all of these spaces, it's not that people don't know that they're there, um, uh, you know, for how many years that they've been built. But it's interesting to see that at least uh, the CIA uh, still. Ha uh, had to have a kind of secrecy around its own infrastructure and its buildings and surveillance in uh, in Langley. Why don't we move on uh, to the next image, which, um, again, I've been thinking of these 
the, the two previous images and this image um, as a part of a kind of trio of uh, ways that um, uh, artists and activists are trying to get at this question of how do we visualize uh, changing, especially technologies of surveillance and spaces for surveillance um, to invite people to see them or understand them differently. Um, this image is uh, by the artists uh, Broomberg and Shinarin. Uh, and uh, this uh, image was made of Yekaterina Samusevich uh, uh, of the band Pussy Riot, uh, who volunteered uh, to be uh, photographed by them using a new 3D facial recognition technology that was developed in Russia. So this connects to some of our conversation earlier about uh, the, the rise of these technologies. Um, this is part of a project where the artists are using this technology to recreate the work of early 20th century German photographer August Sander, um, uh, who photographed Germans as a part of a project called People of the 20th Century. And for them, this this kind of recreation is important because what Sander did was he categorized people, the farmer, the philosopher, uh, the woman, <laughs> uh, and made, uh, made images uh, that were uh, representative and um, that attempted to kind of play with this notion of what it might mean to classify. Uh, and Bloomberg and Shannara are, are, are essentially redoing that project um, with this technology and they're photographing, I think it's something like 200 people. Uh, and uh, uh, this particular subject, uh, Samusevich, was um, uh, posing as the revolutionary, one of the categories. So let's talk about this image. Um, and I'd like to start by just talking, uh, if we can, briefly about its visual impact uh, when you first encounter it. I guess it's, it becomes relatively clear that this image is not made for us because this is not an image we are pleased with and that is easily decipherable by us. This is an image made by a machine for a machine. So this is machine readable, a machine readable face. And um, so th that's why it, it looks odd to us, but we are not, we are not the, um, the, the person uh, the, the, the entities these images are addressed to. Just to be more specific about that, uh, in terms of the gra graphics, the interpolation of the chin and the edges of the, of the mouth, to me, is, besides the cutaway of the face, is very disconcerting. Mm -hmm. Say a bit more about that, Michael. I was just saying that just in in terms of what Simon's saying that you know this is machine created and uh, so I'm just saying you know how I guess because when you see that you have a distortion of the uh, skin under you know the chin is kind of you know pulled away and then you have this twisting or the okay. turning of the you know it's it's just very odd I mean you have this kind of just you know it's 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 just scary, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's far more important that it's made for a machine than made by a machine. So it's machine readable. So we don't have to know how to decipher a, a barcode. That's not meant for us. For us, it looks odd. For the machine, this looks right. It's, it, I guess it contains all the information the machine needs to um, detect this person in a crowd. Mm -hmm. The the other thing which I know, having read about this image this morning, not because it's within the image itself, is it's made from mounted cameras that are in a space. The person doesn't even need to know that their image is being caught. And then mm -hmm. the final image is made up of a composite of all of those camera captures, um, which hence why you have the distortions and hence why the distortions ultimately don't matter because it's the machine that only needs to understand its own creation. Um, it's almost like the uh, the combination of like the earliest, most racist ethnography with the extreme capacity of 21st century surveillance. They've, they've like combined within this technology for me, and it's it's incredibly discomforting. 
And, and one thing, I also read the article that linked to this on The Guardian, and, and because of this kind of, they called it non-collaborative or non-cooperative yeah. gathering of data to then create these uh, machine-readable and machine-ready uh, images of the face, their suggestion was that we just wear um, a mask um, or a balac uh, what's it called? a balaclava uh, uh, to cover the face as being one way to, to, to at least challenge this, but doesn't necessarily challenge the proliferation of these uh, uh, technologies that are able to read and create uh, faces such as these, but rather just to cover up and hide um, from it. So um, that was one thing that came out of it. But it also reminded me, there was an article, um, I think last week in the New York Times, where they were creating faces based on DNA data. And so, uh, and recreating these kind of 3D images as well, too. So not only could it possibly be that we would need uh, an image from um, a camera or, or something that can capture a face, but it could actually be just, you know, um, a cigarette butt that someone drops or the can of a Coke that someone leaves that can then generate these images perhaps at some time. Right. Right. Yeah, this, this picture also kind of links back to forensic anthropology and how anthropologists mm -hmm. try to create images based on... Uh, bodies, bone structures that they find. It's it's um, it's one of the things I wanted to mention uh, too in terms of this and in terms of visibility is that there's also a lot of articles around about um, anti-surveillance clothing, right? That's being offered for people. It's like you can now purchase clothing with kind of dazzle-like designs on it, so you can't be seen. So it's um, it's an interesting people's awareness of possibly being photographed is, is uh, or, or having their images extracted from something is kind of fueling yet another industry, which is how to evade surveillance. I think it's really interesting that the artists chose to um, explore this technology through a reenactment of a project that was about picturing social types, because of mm -hmm. course this technology is about sifting the individual from the crowd. Um, and identifying a particular person and then making that person searchable against a database. Um, and I find this so troubling, uh, and this is one of many technologies that are being developed right now for use in public space and particularly in transit spaces um, for remotely collecting data, remote sensing technologies, all diff even physiological data on persons um, in a way that produces them as suspects um, but also, I think, in a way that challenges um, what has historically been so great about public spaces, and that is that they historically, um, I don't think I'm being too nostalgic here, <laughs> have offered a relative degree of anonymity um, that makes per cer certain kinds of things possible, certain kinds of interactions possible, certain forms of sociology, sociality, um, certain ways of carrying oneself and behaving, and so one of my concerns is that as our public spaces become more and more saturated by these types of technologies, how does that then change what's possible within public space and, and, and how we can interact with one another there? And I think just um, it, it, going back to the, the previous image of geospatial imagery as well, that, uh, you know, just vast amount of landscapes being uh, mapped out and imagery taking place and bringing this home that in, in, in this context of geospatial imagery of a person, if you will, um, and the interconnectedness of that through various other um, uh, technologies that, you know, you, you, you're walking, you're talking, you're sitting, you're writing, you're on the computer, whatever, constantly you're being mapped. Um, so it, it then, then in practice, what does it really mean to, to us? And, uh, um, and I'm reminded, like, you know, all of this, this biometrics program, uh, including the DNA and saliva and fingerprints and retina and iris scan and all that, that how uh, the FBI um, initially there was a, a program uh, around the, the about immigrants called the Secure Communities, which basically allowed local law enforcement to then hold undocumented immigrants for uh, for deportation. Um, but that program was basically being run by the FBI because undocumented immigrants became a laboratory fine-tune and build their biometrics gathering program. <clears throat> and now how that is being now introduced where the LA Sheriff's Department now has the largest um, biometrics gathering. They're, 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 they're close to about 15 million subjects, their capacity. But the bigger issue is of false positives in long run and the error rate that they're talking about. Where within statistical data gathering, you know, the error rate may be 1% or less than that. 
And I was reading somewhere that they're looking at maybe 10% of an error rate or something, you know, just absurdly high. So the impact of that and kind of creating these false positives and the criminalization in the long run becomes very high as well. So I think this, this image, um, it is disconcerting in many different ways. I was just trying to first, I, I couldn't figure out if, um, if uh, someone was wearing a whole body suit and this was just until I looked at it closely and I said, no, this looks like a cutout. Yeah. You know, uh, it was just a bodysuit, uh, only just the face was showing. So it was, um, so yeah, it is kind of disconcerting in many different levels. Yeah, false positives can be funny in a way. Sorry, my line was gone again. Um, uh, the German police uh, hunted a female serial killer for a couple of years, four or five years ago, till it came out that it was actually a lady working at the company that produced uses the for the DNA sampling that her DNA was all on almost all the cotton swaps but they were looking for a serial killer who erratically killed people all over Germany mm -hmm. and did the weirdest combination of crimes and they spent several years hunting for her it was always like a big headline so the serial killer struck again <laughs> yeah Just one other point to make here um, is that, as Hamid said, there's there's a scale of, of where we all fall on the why should I worry about it, I've got nothing to hide spectrum. Um, and even though this work has been done, uh, well I don't know if it's exclusively been done, done in Russia, we know that in America these surveillance technologies, lampposts that have antennas, um, Baltimore, Maryland County, um, buses that have audio surveillance, audio recordings, they are put into practice. Um, and so if and when a technology like this is used in a public space in America, where do we think it is? I think it will probably be in areas that have been located by urban police forces as being problematic and probably being poor. And in America that probably means being in communities of color. And so I think we need to think um, as Simone said right at the start of this discussion, um, who is impacted most by these technologies at this point and going forward? Um, and for the majority of Americans, they, they probably think they don't have anything to worry about which is precisely the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why this thing of the simple solution is just knit a mask to wear it might not necessarily work for, for, for everyone. I think it really gets to um, what you all were, were talking about. And as we get to the um, discussion on body cams, yeah. the idea of these walking, driving, talking, uh, a human closed circuit television being captured by the, the police worn body camera could probably produce many uh, iterations of these types of um, things. Yeah, why don't we um, why don't we move to that image now? Because I uh, that is a great transition. Um, and uh, this is so the previous three images have been essentially uh, 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 photojournalistic art projects uh, described in various ways. Um, this is a news image um, uh, that illustrated a story about police and wearable cameras. Um, so uh, I, I like some of that that just that description that you just gave of kind of moving, living, you know, kind of walking closed circuit televisions with bodies um, in, in an image like this. And so obviously uh, the body cam has been um, uh, very much a topic uh, in the news and in the mainstream media um, and um, is being both uh, touted by some as a solution um, to uh, police use of force issues and also uh, we are being warned very much about the effects of um, the use of these. So um, let's start with the image here and then maybe the image can help us think more about the way that the media is visualizing the technology. Um, so what sorts of things do we see here um, and, and that maybe we haven't quite seen yet in this edit in terms of, um, in terms of just photo content? I mean, what's striking is it's the black police officer that comes to represent the face of policing in America, or at least in Sandy Springs. And that the caption says it's taser, which, as we know, taser is supposed to be some non-lethal type of very lethal uh, weapon. That's um, 
that's really profiting from all of these um, calls for body cameras. A lot of them uh, being non-bid uh, contracts that have been made with police departments um, for these types of things. But everyone in the background seems to be smiling or just, you know, hanging around with this particular officer. And so the ways that uh, th these things get sold to the public, or at least through Taser, um, uh, uh, probably belies something else that's going on here. For example, um, I think it was in Seattle that they had a hackathon, uh, uh, the police department, to see if people can hack, uh, uh, to redact the police data. They also have a YouTube channel that um, posts their um, cop, cop, uh, cop cams uh, streams on. So all of these things, I think we hear from other people as well too, but I find this photo you know, pretty interesting. This is something that we are, uh, we are in a major campaign here in Los Angeles that Taser International uh, is the one that is supplying these Axon cameras to the LAPD and like you said, Simone, uh, there's a no-bid contract and there's uh, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of money to be made. I think that this photograph also reminds me of uh, you know, the way the background is set up but not as, in, in, as such where in, in, in LA, uh, the uh, Skid Row area in downtown Los Angeles, that's where we are based out of, um, has one of the largest unhoused uh, population in the United States. LA County has one of the largest homeless population and, and Skid Row has one of the largest in LA County. Where um, several of these uh, CCTV and several of these technologies and including body cameras, um, where they are always tried and, tried and tested into these communities first. Um, and to kind of look at really the vulnerability factor of uh, unhoused communities and, and, and just the, the sheer uh, unequity exists. Um, but it, it really then ultimately going back to it that in the, in the long term, uh, to me this photograph it, it reminds me of how these technologies are being used in, in, to complement policing programs uh, like the broken windows policies and broken windows programs and how they are serving massive displacement of uh, poor and unhoused communities for gentrification to happen and how these spaces are constantly being uh, you know constricted and, and displacement taking place so it, it, it shows to me that where now maybe this this uh, uh, this cop is wearing a body camera and the, and the community that he's in people are out on the street um, but in a way that how do we get rid of these undesirables to have some penthouse apartments to be built <laughs> in these neighborhoods. So I'm, so I'm kind of bringing it home in LA that what this photograph really signifies. Right. I mean one other thing that this photograph suggests is civilians wearing cameras as well. You know this, this photograph was from 2010 when these cameras were first being introduced and it's interesting to look at how citizen journalism you know, from uh, the Arab Spring through Occupy Wall Street has kind of turned the tables on surveillance too, which is something uh, that we should just throw into the mix on surveillance, that we're not only being watched, we're watching others. You know, earlier someone brought up the notion of uh, photographers not being allowed in certain kinds of places. There's been demonstrations around in London, for instance, a couple of years ago, where people were wearing placards saying, you know, I'm a photographer, not a terrorist. So there's this notion of taking back surveillance and surveillance that is worth examining, too, in the context of our discussion today. I must ask, I presume you put this image into the edit as well, in light of um, Eric Garner and um, sorry, it's early in the morning. The, my mind's gone. The Ferguson killing, Michael Brown's Michael Brown. death. Um, right. Because a lot of us didn't know how to respond immediately um, to the Ferguson killing, and it was what almost three months before the grand jury passed their, their non-indictment. Um, and so we looked to the family and, and passed their grieving. Their, their definitive call was for wearable body cameras on the police forces. Um, that certainly would have had an effect in providing knowledge surrounding the death of, of their son. Um, but it also served to, re, to ignite the debate in America as to whether that is a good thing, blanket across all police forces. Um, and. I don't know where we stand with that debate right now. Um, where's, where's public opinion even? Because in the, in, 
in the same couple of weeks after Michael Brown's parents made that request, I saw very long investigative journalism pieces which fell both sides of the debate. Right, and you also, you also see... visibility versus um, not, right, yeah. And I think that's where that hackathon comes in, that the police are actively sought out ways to, uh, to the data could be lost, parts could be removed, parts could be redacted, the camera could be turned off. And so that the idea of surveillance, you know, these people in the background don't have cameras trained on him, but perhaps, um, you know, that, that might add to a different, a different context, a different angle, and a different story, because the police body cam is still, again, facing out on the public and not necessarily recording um, the police actions. Um, and, and so that point of view um, is, is, is one of, uh, of, of policing. Right. And also in, in recent cases when uh, people have gone back to body camera imaging that in court cases, the people who are defending the officers wearing them saying, well, you know, it only shows things from this angle. What yeah. they're not seeing in this picture is this or this or this. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting aspect to these as well. Mm -hmm. And then we have the killing of John Crawford in Walmart, Tamir Rice, and as well as Eric Garner with video evidence. And so there's still the same narrative that constructs blackness as, as already and always criminal. And that's the kind of um, racial gaze that, uh, that is placed on those things and those, and those things. So it, it needs to kind of have a rethinking or um, uh, a remaking of, of our relation to, um, to surveillance, uh, to policing, and these types of things. And that's exactly what's been, um, uh, what at least, you know, this has been the, the, the flip side to this is that it's helped generate a lot of conversation and mm -hmm. in a way uh, help demystify how we look at surveillance, spying, and infiltration, and it's wholesome. So, mm -hmm. so that's at least one thing that has emerged out of it. But, but I think it's also interesting that uh, in L.A., um, the, the, the the police commission, the Los Angeles Police Department Police Commission had a had a couple of community hearings, um, and um, you know once people get to know the scale and the interconnectedness of all these surveillance technologies, um, the the mood shifts and and how then that and, and you know and the mood shifts not just into a like pausing but a complete rejection. Of, mm -hmm. of these body cameras as well, and there was an over, there was overwhelming response, uh, particularly from when the first hearing was in South Central, uh, and particularly a bunch of youth there who were playing basketball, and then once they found out, and once they were they became more aware, they spoke very forcefully because they know that they are moving targets mm -hmm. as a result, of it. and ultimately, and so um, we as as of my group, the Stop LABD Spying Coalition, we've taken a very clear position, and we uh, put out a report and just get ready to put out a more detailed report on the use of body cameras as well in the next week and a half or so. So I think it's there is definitely um, an opportunity here, but also how uh, once there is uh, more information um, and awareness, uh, how the decisions and people think differently of these. I, I'm interested in... Sorry. No, do you go ahead. Um, I'm deeply troubled by the fact that, you know, these are manufactured by a company that made its money on tasers. Uh, and, and, and just to go back to Simone's point, I, I just wonder about the extent to which the racialized gaze that um, she articulated so well gets built into these, the actual development of these technologies, the funding of the development, and then, of course, their use, um, such that... Um, perhaps the camera, you know, this, this wearable body camera functions in a way analogous to the taser gun. It's understood as a technology for subduing certain kinds of populations, populations that are presumed not to be self-subduing, right, yeah. that are presumed to need some sort of purportedly safe, you know, forcible measure um, in, in order to maintain control. Uh, and so th that's something else I just find deeply troubling about um, the wearable body cams. But to me, it also shows this one le this level that the surveillance apparatus eats its children. So normally we would um, so this even though the the camera is looks in the other way, it's also part of the surveillance operation on the police officer. So even the police officers so are person uh, persons we normally. Um, see as part of the surveillance operation be, are now under surveillance. So the, 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 the whole mechanism of surveillance becomes a huge machine where they, even they are not an acting member anymore. 
so much. They become a tool for gathering more information, even on their actions. But I think just on that point, though, oh, uh, yet how when it comes to that level of surveillance, when it's supposed to be monitoring law enforcement, you constantly see how those that that part of that gets sabotaged. Mm -hmm. And in practice, uh, you know, something that we saw uh, in L.A. out of a federal consent decree and how one of the things was that before this was the, and this is right after Rodney King beatings, when the Christopher Commission came back and they started talking about uh, dash cameras uh, to monitor. Mm -hmm. And then as they were installed, uh, uh, finally around 2000, um, a 2009, 2010, and again the laboratory became communities of color. It was uh, they, they launched them in uh, in Southeast Division, which has Nickerson Gardens and Jordan Downs and and, and housing projects. Out of the 300 patrol cars, uh, 92 of them the the cops sabotaged and broke the antennas intentionally. So so how <laughs> when we when we flip the script on and how this would result in monitoring of, of law enforcement, I think by practice there is so much corruption. Uh, that uh, that I think it's, it's it remains a, a completely a one-way street. I just I just want to uh, just uh, I'm sorry I was going to say something else as well that the imagery and going back to the racialized uh, uh, aspect of the imagery as well I'm reminded that how this policing practice of predictive policing is now being being pushed where they can predict crime and create these hot zones and and send a bunch of cruisers. Uh, and, and real quickly, the way it, it started off in L.A. was, it goes back to a, a grant from, the US, from a U.S. military to a professor of anthropology at UCLA who was able to develop these algorithm units and all that to predict acts of terrorism in Iran, in Iraq, and Afghanistan, and Pakistan. But when he brought it home, first of all, kind of formed his own private company called Prekpol, short for predictive policing. But the imagery that he used in 2009 was that on one hand, so he brought the LAPD and the U.S. military together. And in the slideshow, he had one slide of men from Afghanistan sitting with weapons. Um, and he went to East LA and took photos of young uh, Chicano and Latino youth. And the, and the other imagery was sold with those photographs where the Afghani men were labeled as terrorists. And this photograph of some young kids in a park in East Los Angeles, it was labeled as gang members and urban predators. So how this imagery gets used to, to sell and advance these programs, so, so I just want to share that as well. Yeah, then we come back to the, to the question, so how, why should I care? And this is a, such a question that pops up so often within these debates, because these debates are mostly led by those who shouldn't be afraid, because I know it is not targeted at me at first. And that's a, that's a huge problem, and that's why um, this uh, disempowerment of minorities all around the world is so, works so well because it's easy for those who who lead the discussion on surveillance and all, all these things. They well, I'm not affected. Why should we be affected by it? But we very rarely hear from those who are affected by these um, techniques. Uh, but I think we do actually hear, but just has to be where you're listening. So, for example, we charge genocide in Chicago or the Black Lives Matter movement. They're they're very much on the front of discussing um, these things, and as well, uh, stop LAPD spying. So, just a matter of um, where our ears are tuned to. I think. Uh, I just want to um, hop in to the discussion at this point to do a bit of business and uh, let everybody know that um, our original plan had been to go to the top of the hour. Uh, whatever hour that is for you, and uh, we have about 10 minutes left of that. Um, we're happy to bleed over into that a little bit so that we can have a, a, a good, robust discussion. Um, I am uh, 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 going to suggest that we um, move forward in the edit and that we um, uh, jump to the last two images in the edit, which we want to make sure we have a couple of time, uh, we have a bit more time to discuss. Um, and uh, Marvin, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about kind of uh, the last two images in this edit and um, what sorts of things you all were hoping to um, invite or invoke 
by turning to what uh, I would call uh, the images more circulated in popular culture that are also very much images of surveillance. So yeah. do you want to say a minute about that? <laughs> Sure. I, you know, I think this notion of people thinking, what do we have to be afraid of? I think everybody's got something to be afraid of. And as people are increasingly aware of them, their activities being tracked through the world, they're made nervous by it. And so we wanted to pick one or two images that spoke to how uh, surveillance images became popularized. So that's how the uh, the one that we're looking at now, actually, which is the drone flying over a beach, right, um, speaks about the popularization of drones themselves, which I mentioned earlier. I'm startled by how many are for sale uh, around the legal issues, both on state and federal levels, about who can use drones, what's proper drone use, whether it's okay for consumers to use drones, but not for businesses to use drones. So that's why we threw that in there. It kind of moves it away uh, from the Big Brother aspect to the fact that maybe we've incorporated a little bit of Big Brother in ourselves. So we hope to talk about that a little bit. So and the, 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 this is a TMZ video freeze frame, um, a video that surfaced last September of NFL player uh, Ray Rice punching his then fiance Janae Palmer. Um, and so here we have a very different kind of um, notion of surveillance jumping into the popular culture context than, um, than the final image that Marvin was just talking about. Um, uh, I, I want to note that this is, if you, if, if you search for this image or if you've seen uh, TMZ or other uh, popular culture coverage of this um, incident, uh, this is an example of the media recirculating a very specific freeze frame of this image um, everywhere and over and over again. And so the overlay, um, the time, the, the, the kind of watermarking overlay uh, mm -hmm. of the image that said, you know, that brands that this is ours, TMZ supports, um, the, the, the slow motion framing, I think it's really important here. And so Part of, I think, what we're interested in is, is thinking about um, uh, maybe the branding of surveillance as entertainment uh, is a part of, I think, what, what, to me at least, is happening in this image. And so I'd be curious to hear what other panelists have to say about that. Yeah, the slow motion uh, in the parentheses at the bottom gives it a kind of a live, a still from a live action movie kind of. I mean, that was that is the effect of slow motion. But the idea that whose bodies get to be um, on display in these frames, taken up as entertainment, surveillance, or otherwise, and then branded as you said with the TMZ um, watermark across the screen. Because even in the caption here, um, her name isn't mentioned. Although you did uh, mention her, uh, her Janae's name. Her name is she's just uh, the then fiance, yeah. and her body is on display. Play. There's parts where they have to kind of um, mute it out or blur it out as well too. And so these types of um, violences. And later on, I think she went on Instagram and talked about the media saturation and the pain with this kind of replaying of this event that it caused for her. So I think it's kind of interesting whether it's uh, you know a, an elevator situation that was captured by TMZ. I think a month before this came out with uh, Solange and Beyonce and Jay Z or if it is Rihanna's body uh, 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 brutalized uh, being put on display of like these black women's bodies that get taken up as fodder for entertainment on TMZ and other spaces is um, quite interesting. Yeah. And to me, yeah, that notion of the, the, um, the, the kind of veneer of evidence, well, we're just showing the evidence so that mm -hmm. we can determine right, what, like we can show what happened and confirm what happened and um, punish accordingly, right? It's all in this frame, but which as you say, is very much uh, is very much about focusing on certain people's bodies and focusing on black women's bodies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But well, it's and it reminds me. Sorry. No, you go. <laughs> um, it reminds me in that way, Kara, of a program like America's Most Wanted, which Ooh. ostensibly is about getting the quote unquote bad guys, but, you know, recurrently sensationalizes violence against women in a manner that is clearly intended to titillate and create visual pleasure for for viewers. Um, and so that's that's one thing that I see here. And another quick point that I'll make, somebody mentioned earlier 
the limitations of critiquing surveillance uh, narrowly on, on the grounds of a kind of protection of privacy argument. And I think this, this image and its replay and this incident really brings that point home because, of course, um, for women historically, quote unquote, private spaces were not necessarily safe spaces, you know, and safe and, and spaces that um, actually perhaps were more dangerous because the only surveyor was uh, the the man of the place, right? Um, and so I think I think another important issue here is is in terms of the history of domestic violence and surveillance and the articulation there. And um, the, this elevator in a public building as a kind of semi-public, semi-private space. Mm -hmm. um, and if we watch the lo longer video, one of the things that's um, really troubling about it is, is how not unmoved the elevator attendant is um, and how he observes, much like police often observe, the man's privacy you know, on calls of domestic abuse and are very hesitant to kind of cross that boundary into um, the domestic relationship, you know, or the domestic sphere. Yeah, but I also find it very interesting. So on one hand, this is shown with the excuse, we have to show you documents of what actually happened. And then, so, but what do you bleep out? What do you blur out? So it's 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 this weird thing. So you have to you have to make it safe enough to show on TV, but you have to uh, really go into someone's privacy and destroy the privacy. So it's it's a huge it's a huge topic for me. So what what to blur out and what not, and what what can be shown, what you don't show, and so it's it's the whole thing seems quite absurd. I also might be a bit perverse here, but I'm in some ways surprised that the image quality is so poor. I'm wondering at what point our society in these semi-private spaces will be saturated with high-definition cameras that really mm. capture um, an image that's, you know, <clears throat> the quality we expect to see um, in television and film. And I can't presume that moment's too far away. But perhaps that graininess suggests an authenticity that is something that we mm -hmm. still want to, mm -hmm. that buttresses our titillation. Um, it, it's, it's like we are, we are seeing something that we are not supposed to mm -hmm. be privy to. Right. I mean, that's a common theme through, through these pictures, the view from above, the darkness, that or the fuzziness of pictures, it's it's all part of the aesthetic of surveillance. Or all surveillance. The, the way it kind of links up into this ongoing, uh, uh, you know, just just conversation or or narrative around preventing violence itself, where you know, uh, cameras in classrooms, cameras in homes to watch the babysitters, cameras. So in a way that this feeds into, and then, you know, now with the body camera, cameras to prevent state violence. Uh, so, so I think that just there's just the use of the surveillance and the underlying messaging um, becomes very critical as well. And this, again, reinforcing uh, where it is only through these kind of surveillance are we able to understand better. I mean, violence against women has been going on as as science. Rather than looking at the, the the deeper issues, I think this imagery becomes a token, and an imagery becomes an opportunity to to chill the, the larger debate uh, and use these as tools of kind of pushing a very narrow agenda as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that, I, think I think if we can, I, I just want to I want to return to. Um, concern for uh, Janae, the, the subject here, um, it is branded, someone did profit, TMZ obviously have very successful strategies, they went to whoever they knew like could s provide them the video and probably paid the highest amount you know, that was required of them. Um, so some individuals or, or some, someone in, in the building and then latterly TMZ and their advertisers themselves have profited from this image. Um, and I think that gets forgotten sometimes, even when TMZ tries to remind us with not one, not two, but three <laughs> plaques. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, why don't we transition now um, to
to the final image in the edit. Um, and um, Marvin, I, th I think, did a nice job engaging some of the, the issues that this image raises in terms of uh, the kind of everyday quality. Um, and so what I thought I might do is just, uh, I've been uh, attempting to be a good student of, of your discussion and your ideas and keep some notes here. And uh, I thought I would just list off a few of the, the, the things we've learned, some of the themes that have pulled out uh, that we can pull out from the discussion overall. Uh, and um, I, this image in some ways is an interesting one to end on in that regard because it is a kind of visual digestion in a way or almost a, it's uh, uh, an icon of our conversation to a certain extent. Um, so some of the things we talked about, um, uh, who's doing the looking, um, what are the uh, uh, what are the vulnerabilities in terms of communities consistently, uh, historically, and contemporarily being looked at? Um, whose interests are at play in surveillance? Um, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the impact of, of various kinds of surveillance narratives. So an image like this, for example, um, might make surveillance seem pretty creepy, but maybe also fun, depending on one's interpretation, right? So we talked a little bit about that kind of, um, those differences. Um, uh, the role of privacy came up uh, a little bit as well in our conversation. Um, uh, and then, um, to me at least, uh, a, a couple of the, of the really dominant themes of our discussion today have been um, uh, the, that so much of surveillance is in fact invisible. <laughs> and, and because of that, um, uh, uh, certain kinds of images and certain practitioners, including Simon um, among them, uh, are trying to figure out ways to help us see the very things that we are not supposed to see um, and that are at the heart of surveillance culture. Uh, and so um, uh, with that, I will uh, turn things over to Michael for a final wrap up and I'll just say thank you panelists. This was a really uh, engaging and provocative discussion and I'm sure the Twitter conversation and, and those who will watch the salon later um, uh, will uh, feel equally animated. Um, so Michael, I'll hand things off to you to wrap up. That was a wonderful job, Kara. Thank you so much to the, our panelists. Uh, amazing discussion to uh, Open Society for making this possible along with us um, to our audience. Uh, one thing that's important uh, to say, uh, the way that we're living in this virtual uh, and flex time world is that there will be a, a rebroadcast of the um, discussion immediately after, maybe it takes 90 seconds. Um, it will be on the on the post, and then uh, in the next, let's say three or four weeks, we will have uh, highlight clips um, that are produced by the very talented Sandra Roa for us. Um, so those will be available too. If you sign up for our email, uh, you will also, or follow us on Twitter, you'll also get notification of the next salon. And uh, we'll see you then. Thanks so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. You. Bye, everyone. Bye, Kara. Bye, Michael. Thanks.